when the brother was um, is it is it loud enough? Is it good? When the brother was doing the introduction, he introduced me by saying Sheikh Ali Najjar. I appreciate the respect, but hopefully, inshallah, uh, I remember the first time I came, I made the same exact announcement. I guess repetition is good, inshallah. Uh, either brother is good, or Ali is good, or just bro, inshallah, should be good. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم جميعا يا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين صلوات Respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 official attributes For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim السلام المؤمن المهيمن المتكبر العزيز الجبار القهار and so on and so forth each one of these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala represents a specific value that's a part of his essence and a part of his nature for example one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-rahman or ar-rahim the merciful or ar-rahman being the beneficent each one of these values represents a specific attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the attribute that could be found in us as human beings as well. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a Lord of mercy, He intended that we taste some of the sweetness of those values. Meaning Allah has rahmah intrinsically wired within His nature. He wants me as a human being to taste some of that rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, has karam al kareem generosity within his nature. He wants me as being to taste some of that sweetness because Allah is a merciful Lord. That's why the hadith al-Qudsi comes forward and says quite clearly, كُنْتُ كَنْزًا مَخْفِيًّا فَأَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ أُعْرَفْ فَخَلَقْتُ الْخَلْقِ Allah says, I was a hidden treasure. I loved to be known. Thus, I created mankind. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends us to taste some of the sweetness of His values. Yet how did He do that? Allah had to devise a specific method. A bridge between the creation and the creator. A bridge between Him and us. A bridge between the absolute and the limited. So that we the finite human beings could taste some of the sweetness of His infinite nature. How did Allah do that? You see when you examine the genesis of time. And time before existence, before creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a number of values displayed in front of him. Generosity. Karam. 
for example. Trustworthiness, patience. Allah said, I want to give these values to insan. Thus, what did he do? He created specific individuals who manifested those values in human form. He took, for example, the value of mercy, he put it into an individual. He took the value of patience, he put it into an individual. He took the value of generosity, he put it into an individual. You see, because I can easily explain this to you in the example or analogy of a prism. You see, a prism is made of three specific elements. White light going into the prism, the prism itself, and then different colors coming out of the right side of the prism. This prism could be explained in the following analogy to understand what I'm trying to say. The white light could be said to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prism is Islam, and each light was one of the infallibles of Al Muhammad. Allah comes in, another light comes out, which is patience, manifested within Hassan alayhi salam, for example. Allah goes into the prism, patience comes out, which could be said to be Imam al Kaabim, for example. That's when I see Al Muhammad, I don't see individuals with values, I see values manifested within individuals. There's a big difference. You see, I see, for example, a man by the name of Hassan. Hassan may be generous. Hassan may be trustworthy. Hassan may be kind. Hassan is a human being with values. That yet then you have a human being who he himself is a value. He doesn't have values. You see, when I see Muhammad, I don't see Muhammad. I see mercy. When I see Ali, I don't see Ali. I see Haq. When I see Hussein, I don't see Hussein, I see bravery. When I see Zainul Abideen, I don't see Zainul Abideen, I see obedience. When I see somebody, for example, such as Baqir, I don't see Baqir, I see science. When I see Sadiq, I don't see Sadiq, I see knowledge. When I see Kavum, I don't see Kavum, I see patience. When I see Riva, I don't see Riva, I see satisfaction. When I see somebody such as Jawad, I don't see Jawad, I see generosity. When I see Hadi, I don't see Hadi, I see God. When I see Askari, I don't see Askari, I see hope. And when I see Sahib al Zaman, I don't see Sahib al Zaman. I see the manifestation of justice on the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you find Ahlul Bayt manifested these specific values. Now, when you come to the character of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. What characteristic did the Prophet manifest? Which is going to be the premise of our discussion tonight. You see, the Prophet was a man who manifested all values and all characteristics, yet one of them stood out, which was Rahmah, mercy. Chapter 21 of the Holy Quran, verse number 107, being Surah Al Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and begins to describe the main reason why Rasulullah was sent to humanity and mankind. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, one of the most famous verses that I'm sure many of us have memorized. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah says, Ya Muhammad, I haven't sent you except as a mercy to mankind. Now, Ya Rasulullah, you have generosity. Why did Rasulullah say mercy? Or why did Allah say mercy? He's making a very essential point. The Holy Prophet of Islam, yes, he had many characteristics within his personality. Yet mercy stood out. Generosity stemmed from his mercy. Patience stemmed from his mercy. Trustworthiness stemmed from the bedrock of his characteristics, which were mercy. Now, of course, the mercy of Rasulullah could be explained in three specific ways, which I would like to give you tonight. The first layer of the mercy of the character of Muhammad was a mercy that came with him. The second layer of the mercy of Muhammad is a mercy that came after him, which we have today. And the third layer of the mercy of Muhammad is a mercy which has yet to come, which will come later. Let's explain these three different layers. Number one, the form of mercy which came with him. Rasulullah's mercies, when he went within the time of Jahiliyyah, because as you know, the Holy Prophet lived in Mecca for a number of years, 10 years. He then went to Medina for 13 years. The minute Rasulullah launched his prophethood, he came with three elements which comprise the very nature of his mercy. Number one, he came with a kitab, which was the Qur'an. Number two, he came with sunnah, which was the implementation of the Qur'an. 
And number three, he came with wilaya, which was the manifestation of the Qur'an. Let's explain these three. Number one, he came with a kitab, the Holy Qur'an. قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا Or for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and says, this Qur'an comes and commands you to be upright. Number one, the Qur'an, the book, the scripture, the formula. That if I today was to go, for example, to a doctor, the doctor would come to me, and number one, he would give me a, what? He would give me a paper which would tell me exactly what I'm supposed to be taking it for medicine. That script, that manual was the Holy Qur'an. People were out of their minds, straight up. People were crazy. I mean, if I was to explain you what people would do in the time of Jahiliyyah, you would say, my God, we're living in heaven today. In Jahiliyyah, you find, for example, somebody such as Amr al-Qais, who was one of the most famous poets within the times of Arabia. He wrote a specific poem where he explained his sexual relationship with Aniza, his cousin. He wrote this poem, which is still available today. You can easily read it if you're familiar with the Arabic language. This poem was taken and hung up in the Kaaba as one of the best forms of literature in the time. You could examine this and you could imagine the Kaaba being the house of Allah, being the very sign and sha'air of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala served as a place where poems which explain explicit relationships were hung. You find furthermore within the times of Jahiliyyah, people would put flags, you know, on their house, a black flag, Typically, the females would take this flag, they would put it on their house, telling the people that I am open for specific acts which don't need to be mentioned. You know, today, you have bars, you have, for example, clubs. Back in the days, they would simply put a flag inviting the people to do specific things with them. Within the times of Jahiliyyah, people would assess a human being not by his character, but by his culture. Is he part of me? Does he come from the same tribe? Does he come from the same ethnicity? Does he come from this country? Then I'm not going to speak out against him. If he doesn't come from my tribe, then yes, I'm going to speak out against him. Basically, they would cherry pick the oppression that they would want to go against. And don't be surprised, the same thing is happening today. You find, for example, something happens in Egypt. They say, let's begin to speak out against it. Yet then something happens in Bahrain. They say, no, alhamdulillah, we can just stay silent. The same thing, Jahiliya, subhanAllah, repeats itself. You know, when the quote comes, says, history repeats itself. It's a very true, it holds truth to it. That Jahiliya repeats itself in that sense. That the Holy Prophet of Islam came and brought them that book which came and brought guidance. That beacon of nur. This Qur'an came and brought people to the path which is upright. Number one, the Qur'an, which is the kitab, the book of Allah. Then you have the sunnah, which served as what? The character of the Prophet himself. The way the Prophet would walk was the sunnah. The way the Prophet would speak was a sunnah. The way the Prophet would treat people in front of him was part of the sunnah. Yet then there's a third element which many people tend to put on the side which activates the first two elements. You see, I can come forward and have the kitab and the sunnah, but if I don't have that third element, there's no point of the first two. What is that element? You see, within the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes on Muhammad. For example, he comes and he says, Muhammad Rasulullah wa alladheena ma'ahu ashiddao ala al-kuffar rahmau baynahum tarahum rubka'an sujjadan yabtaghuna fadlan min Allahi wa radwana seemahum fi wujuhihim min athar al-sujudi thalika mathalum fi al-tawrati wa mathalum fi al-injil. Allah is constantly emphasizing on the very position of the Prophet. Or for example, Ya ayuhu al-Rasulu inna أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمُبَشِّرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَدَاعِيًا إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ وَسِرَاجًا مُنِيرًا O Prophet, we have sent you as a guidance. Furthermore, Allah comes and says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلْقٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah emphasizes on Muhammad within the Holy Quran. Yet then Muhammad comes and emphasizes on something else. It was almost as if Rasulullah and Allah had a business deal. He came to him and he told him, O Muhammad, I'm going to raise you, yet I want you to raise Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Ya Muhammad, it's my job to put you on a pedestal. Yet I want you to emphasize on the greatness of Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet, throughout his 23 years of prophethood, did one thing. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى I ask nothing from you except to love my family. Rasulullah, don't you have anything else to tell me? Tell me the importance of marriage, for example. 
Tell me the importance of fasting. Tell me the importance of this, of that. He says, no. Ahl al-Bayt is essential. That if I have Quran without Ahl al-Bayt, brothers and sisters, there's no point of loving that Quran. You see, today you have one point, you know how much, how much Muslims you have? 1.8 Muslim, 1.8 billion Muslims. Many Muslims today out there in the world. The majority of Muslims have failed to connect it. Quran, we love it. Yet we're not interested in the manifestation of Quran. I'm interested in Iman within the Holy Quran. Yet I'm not interested in the very man who manifested and encapsulated Quran within his character. That's within the battle of Khandaq when Rasulullah comes and says, ظَهَرَ الْإِيمَانُ كُلُّهُ لِلْكُفْرِ كُلِّهُ Complete Iman has went to the battlefield to fight complete shirk. Look at how much times Rasulullah is emphasizing on Ahl al-Bayt. He comes to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he comes, he comes and he tells him, Ali yun minni wa ana min Ali. Ali is from me and I am from Ali. Ya Ali, hubbuka iman. He says, oh Ali, your love is true iman. He says, Ali yun fikum kal ka'bati fil Islam. He says, Ali to you is like the Kaaba in Islam. Furthermore, he's always emphasizing on Ali ibn Abi Talib. I came and I asked a question. Ya Rasulullah, why are you emphasizing on Ahl al-Bayt? He's making a very essential point. He's saying Quran and Sunnah without Ahl al-Bayt is not a complete equation. You see, I can have hydrogen. I can have a whole boat filled with hydrogen. Yet if you don't bring oxygen, it's not going to give me water. Allah comes and says Quran is essential. Yet connect it with that second thiqil. Inni tarikum fikum. الثقلين. Rasulullah comes and says, I have come to you with two weighty things. Rasulullah could have came and said, I've come to you with Quran. Yet that's not enough. He could have come and said, I came to you with Ahl al-Bayt. Yet that's not enough. Connect the two. إِنِّي تَارِكُمْ فِيكُمْ مُثَّقَلَيْنِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ What else? وَعِتْرَةِ أَهْلَ بَيْتِي مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَن تَظَلُّوا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا He says, if you... Stay strong to these two things. You will never be led astray. You have to be able to connect it. Today, the enemy of Allah is trying too hard to disconnect it. Too hard. You know, I was just in Iraq for a ziyara of Arba'een of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And you find this walk from Najaf to Karbala, that multi-million walk. They say 18 million, 25 million people made it to Karbala this year. Do you know what this is doing to the enemy? The enemy has his tanks. The enemy has his weapons. The enemy has this and that. Yet when he sees this walk, it strikes nothing but fear into his heart. He can't handle it. Hussein died. Why are these people walking towards his land from Basra? You know, I was walking from Najaf for three days. I saw a man next to me. I looked at him. I told him, where are you coming from? He said, I'm coming from Basra. Do you know how far it is from Basra to Karbala? Two weeks walking. I told him, why are you walking two weeks? He says, Hussein. I told him, what do you mean Hussein? Tell me something else. He says, Hussein, that's all I need to tell you. I love Hussein. This love is my fuel to go to him. You know, when I come, for example, from Detroit to New York in an airplane, there's fuel to keep the flight going. I told him, what's your fuel to come towards the land of Imam al-Hussein? He said, love, ishq. The same love that made Abbas go crazy on the 10th of Muharram. He would take off his vest. He would go onto the lands of Karbala. They would tell him, Ajuninta ya Abbas. Have you become crazy? Have you went insane? What's wrong with you? He said, Hubbu al-Hussein ajannani. He said, the love of Hussein has made me go crazy. This walk from Najaf to Karbala serves as a connection. يَصِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهِ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلْ They connect what Allah wants to be connected. The enemy, what does he want to do? يَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهِ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلْ They want to cut what Allah wants to be connected. When people today, you know, mutawakkil in the time of Imam al-Hadi, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Mutawakkil, what would you do? Somebody comes and visits Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he would tell him, give me your right hand. They would have to sever an arm to visit Imam al Hussein. A man came. He said, give me, give me your right hand. He turned around. He gave him the right hand. The right hand was already severed. He said, turn around. Give me the left arm. He said, what do you mean give me the left arm? 
I said, take my left arm. If this is what I have to do to visit Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, then I'm more than happy to do it. Do whatever you want for me to visit my Mawla, Abu Abdullah al Hussein. That's one of the most prominent quotes you'll hear when walking from Najaf to Karbala. Is the famous quote that comes and says, Law qatta'u arjulana wal yadayn, na'tika zahfan Sayyidi ya Hussein. If they were to cut my hands and legs, Stopping me from coming to visit you, O Hussein, I would come crawling. What is this love? This love is the connection. Walking towards Imam Hussein is that connection. The enemy of Allah wants to sever that connection. When I come and I say, you have kitab, you have sunnah, and then you have wilaya, you have to connect to all of those three. Walking towards Hussein is that specific connection. The enemy of Allah hates it. Yazid wanted to sever that very connection. To the extent that he would take the head of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, he would place it on a plate and he would take a stick and he would begin to play with those very lips. Zayd ibn Arqam narrates, he said, By God, I saw those same exact lips being kissed by Rasulullah. What is Yazid doing? He's severing it. That's while he's playing with the lips of Imam al Hussein, he mentions these very famous and prominent lines of poetry where he says, ليت أشياخي ببدر شهدوا جزع الخزرج من وقع الأسل لأهلوا واستهلوا ثم قالوا يا يزيد لا تشل لعبت هاشم بالملك فلا خبر جاء ولا وحي نزل He says Bani Hashim played with this dominion No Quran came down No Sunnah came down It's all nothing but a myth What is he doing? Severing Now somebody may come and ask a question Why is it that we have to connect it to أهل البيت? Why isn't that Qur'an is enough? Why do I need wilaya? For a number of reasons. Number one, because Ahlul Bayt were the juice of the prophets. What do I mean? Ahlul Bayt were the encapsulation of all of the prophets. You see, when I look at somebody like Musa alayhi salam, he was revered for what? His strength. When I look at somebody as Jesus, he was revered for his love. Jesus was known to be this loving spiritual character. When I look at somebody such as Job or Ayyub, Ayyub was revered for what? His patience. Each prophet had a specific characteristic. Yet when you examine Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam, all of these characteristics met into one family. They became the encapsulation of all of the characteristics of the prophets. One day Jundub was sitting next to Islam, Jundub being Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, original name being Jundub. He was sitting next to the Holy Prophet of Islam and the Holy Prophet would turn to him. He would tell him, Ya Jundub, if you want to see Musa and his strength, Ayyub and his patience, Jesus and his asceticism, Musa and his strength, Yusuf and his beauty, then look at the man who shall pass by, who is like the moon and sun in radiance, and like the stars shining bright. Jundub says, I turned around and I saw no other than my master, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salatullahi wa salamu alayhi, pass by. Musa, Ayyub, Jesus, all of their qualities were there within the Holy Prophet and within Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen. That Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen became the character who manifested all of the qualities of the Prophets. That's when I come and I say, I love you, O Ahlul Bayt. Why do I love you? Because within you, everything was summarized. I could go and follow Musa, but Musa was simply a piece of the puzzle. I could go and follow Jesus, but Jesus was simply a piece of the puzzle. When I come and I say, I love you, O Al Muhammad, we come and we say, Wa kulla shay Everything was manifested within the character of Al-Muhammad. That when I say I love Ali, I just said I love Jesus. When I said I love Ali, I'm saying I love Musa. When I say I love Ali, I'm saying I love Ibrahim. Because Ali was not an individual. He was a principle. That's why Imam Amir al-Mu'ni, if somebody comes and he says, within a very famous narration, he says, كُنْتُ مَعَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ بَاطِنَا وَمَعَ بْنَ عَمِّي مُحَمَّدْ ظَاهِرًا He said, with the prophets before me, I was hidden. Yet with Muhammad I was manifest. What do you mean you were hidden? Meaning you were there with Musa? You were there with Jesus? What is he saying? He's saying within the time of the prophets, I was there as a principle. Jesus strove to implement haq. I am haq. Ali yun ma'al haq. Wal haq ma'ali. Yadur ma'ahu haithu yadur. I am haq. Musa strove to implement haq. He is haq. 
that he was there as a principal. When I love Ahlul Bayt on the first level, I'm making it clear that I love the very manifestation of all of the characters of the prophets. Number two, the reason why I have to love the Holy Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt is simply because you find each prophet had 12 disciples. Jesus had 12 disciples. Musa had the 12 sons of Jacob, al asbat al Thnaash. And the Holy Prophet had 12. The Holy Prophet was the only man who had an infallible set of 12 individuals and perfect set of 12 individuals. <laughs> Musa alayhi salam has his 12 individuals. He's there walking within the desert. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that he gets lost for 40 years. Now if I want to follow a man, at least give me companions of his which I can follow. I don't want to follow a man who is simply there detached of infallible prophets and indeed companions who could continue his message. Jesus, 12 individuals, they're following him. People such as Judah, people such as other companions of Jesus, Salamullah alayhi. Jesus alayhi salam is there, he's walking. They come to him, they want to take Jesus and place him onto the cross. Why would I follow a set of individuals who took the initiative to crucify their very prophet? Yet the minute the Holy Prophet came into the picture, Allah came and sent the verse, Muhammadun Rasulullah walladheena ma'ahu. Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, and the people with him. He didn't say only Muhammad. He said Muhammad and those with him. Because each prophet came forward with a seed. Musa had the seed to complete Islam. Yeah, he didn't have the soil. Jesus had the seed, yet he didn't have the soil. Muhammad held such a specific and great phase within the religion of Islam. Why? Because it was the phase when the seed met soil. He had the seed, yet he had to plant it somewhere. Where did he plant it? He planted no other family than the family. Allahu alayhi wa sallam. That's on the second level, you find the 12 of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were the 12 infallibles. On the third level, the reason why Ahlul Bayt have to be connected with the Kitab and also with the Sunnah is simply because they are the gate to the Holy Prophet. You see, the reason why I love Ali ibn Abi Talib is because of his love towards the Prophet. Today, one of the saddest things, and I speak to you with all honesty, we find within our communities is the fact that we tend to exaggerate in the state of Ali ibn Abi Talib to the extent that we raise him over the very Prophet himself. You find this very common in specific communities. I remember I was actually in a community, not to mention the culture, and I mentioned that the Iman of Rasulullah is superior to the Iman of Ali ibn Abi Talib to show that the Holy Prophet is the template. He's the pole of the tent, as one would say. A man came to me after I finished the majlis. He told me, Excuse me, brother, very nice majlis, thank you very much, Allah bless you. But you mentioned something which I disagree with. I told him, go ahead, what is it? He said, you mentioned that the iman of the Holy Prophet is superior to the iman of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I told him, yes, I'm waiting for the point, what's the point you're trying to make? He said, incorrect, I disagree. I told him, why so? He said, in the incident of Isra wal Mi'raj, Allah used the voice of Ali ibn Abi Talib to speak to Rasulullah. I told him, first of all, can you give me a reference to this specific hadith? He said, no, I'm sorry, I don't have a reference. I told him, do you see the difference between you and I? I told him, I'm not going to get into an argument here, but just off the bat, do you see the difference? He said, no, what's the difference? I told him, I'm giving you Quran, you're giving me hadith. Brothers and sisters, when we're trying to reach the truth, and we're trying to reach the haqiqah of what Islam is, let us not go to the words of the creation over the words of the Creator. Allah comes and says, take Qur'an. Ahl bayt themselves come forward and say, if our words go contradictory to the words of the Qur'an, فَضْرِبُوهُ عَلَى الْحَائِطِ Hit it against the wall. Don't take it into consideration. That the way I prove that the words of Al Muhammad are legit is by me seeing if they're in correlation with the very words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's like, brother, but what do you mean? You're telling me all of these Mawlanas that come and describe... I told him, calm down, number one. Number two, go to the Qur'an. Allah comes and says, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدْ فَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْعَابِدِينَ If there was to be a son to me, Muhammad would be that son. This is within the Holy Qur'an. Yet Allah doesn't have a son. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَحَدُ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ Yet if there was to be a son to Allah, 
Allah comes and says, فَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْعَابِدِينَ Then say, O Muhammad, you are the most qualified of being that son. That's when I see the very incident of Ali ibn Abi Talib within the night of Hijrah. That's what shows to me the greatness of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That he was a man who sacrificed himself for Rasulullah. He gave his life for the Holy Prophet of Islam. They say even Amir al-Mu'mineen as a young child, he would chase the Holy Prophet, protecting him from any injuries, from any people throwing stone. That's why I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. The reason why we love Ahlul Bayt is because they were the moons. A moon in itself does not have light. Yet it's simply a reflection of the sun. Muhammad was that sun. Al-Muhammad were those moons. The moon within itself doesn't have light. The sun is what gives light to those moons. I love Ahlul Bayt because they reflected the message of the Prophet. Let us not raise Ahlul Bayt to such an extent that we make it look almost as if Muhammad was the student and Ali was the teacher. No, 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 no. Ali ibn Abi Talib himself comes over and says, Allamani Rasulullah al-Fubab. وَمِنْ كُلِّ بَابٍ تُفْتَحُ أَلْفُ بَابٍ He comes and he says, Rasulullah taught me 1,000 doors of knowledge. Each door opens up another 1,000 doors of knowledge. He comes and he says, أَنَا Or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes and says, أَنَا رَبِيبُ اللَّهِ وَأَنَا رَبِيبُ مُحَمَّدِ He said, Muhammad was the one taught by Allah and I am the one who is taught by Muhammad. That's when I come and I say, I love Ahlul Bayt. Why? Because they are that gate to the Holy Prophet of Islam. Muhammad is the gate to Allah. Ali is the gate to Muhammad. When the hadith comes and says, Ana Madinatul Ilmi, How could I get stuck with the door and I forget this city? Doesn't make sense. It's almost as if I buy a car, you know, 2012 Mercedes, and I buy this car and all I do is wash the door. I don't take the initiative to go inside of the car. There's a big problem. He's washing the window. He's taking care of it. Well, he doesn't go inside of the car. Allah comes and says, go inside of the car. Don't stay outside. Don't get interested by the exterior. The exterior is a means to the interior. That exterior is Ahl Bayt. The interior is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That on the first level, the mercy that Rasulullah came with was comprised of these three essential points, being the kitab, the sunnah, and the wilaya. The first mercy is the mercy that Rasulullah came with. As for the second mercy, is a mercy which we have today. All of the justice that we see in the world today is a stem from the justice of a man who came 1400 years ago. All of the freedom that we see in the world today stems from the freedom of a man who came 1400 years ago. A black president is impossible to come into power were it not for Muhammad to come and free slavery. It would be impossible for a female to be today in government. Somebody such as Hillary Clinton, who is speaking like she owns the world, would be impossible for such a lady to come into power were it not for a man who came and stopped infant females from being buried alive. That what people fail to realize today is that the very source of freedom and justice within the world is no other than Muhammad. That the very man who gave you freedom, you know what's ironic today? You find people come forward and beginning to draw the Holy Prophet with bombs placed on his head. The problem is where? You know there's a hadith by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. He comes and he says, don't use the power of your speech against the mother who taught you how to speak. Meaning many times we speak up to our mother with disrespect. She says, Ali, go and wash the dishes. I speak to her almost as if I'm the mother and she's the son. This hadith is interesting. Yet there's a correlation I would like to make. Imam Amir al-Mu'min comes and says, don't use the power of your speech against the one who taught you how to speak. The problem today is that people are using their freedom to defame a man who gave them it. You see, when people come today and they draw the Prophet with bombs on his head, they fail to realize the freedom that they have to defame such a man came from the man that they're trying to defame. Rasulullah is the one that gave you that freedom. Why are you busy defaming him? Were it not for the sacrifice that Rasulullah made 1400 years ago, you wouldn't know what freedom is. You wouldn't know what justice is. Today, somebody such as Obama comes and says, I learned from the mercy and justice of who? 
Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King comes and says, I learned from the justice of Gandhi. Gandhi comes and says, I learned from Hussein. And Hussein was simply a student of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa That the bedrock is Muhammad. That's when we come and we say there's a mercy today. You look at the world today, everything we see stems from the greatness of the Holy Prophet of Islam. That 1400 years later, after his very death, his name is still being raised. Allah comes and says, We have exalted your remembrance. To the extent that somebody such as Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, you know, when you go to Hollywood today and you look at that famous walk of fame, you see, for example, Michael Jackson, you see Britney Spears, whose name doesn't need to be mentioned. You find what? That you see these names, right? Muhammad Ali, in 2011, they came and they said, listen, now it's your turn for us to place your name onto this walk of fame. He said, I don't want it on the floor. Place it on the wall. He said, why? They came to him. He stood up. You know, he's an old man. He can barely speak. He said, I don't want the name of my prophet to be stepped upon. 1400 years later, Allah comes and says, We have raised your remembrance. Allah comes and says, Always will his remembrance be raised. Go wherever you want. Go to the east, go to the west, go to the north, go to the south. The name Muhammad will always be raised. That today they come and tell you the most prominent name in the world is the name Muhammad. Not John, not Smith, not whatever, not Michael. Muhammad is the most prominent name in the world today. Why? Because Allah comes and says, Muhammad's name I will always protect. That's when you look at mercy today, and the mercy of Rasulullah, that he came forward and brought to society, is still alive in our societies today. Justice stems from the justice of the Holy Prophet of Islam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now that's the second type of mercy. The third type of mercy which the Holy Prophet came forward and brought and the third layer of his mercy is a mercy which has still not come. You see, because Islam could be explained in the following analogy. Ibrahim alayhi salam was the seed that seed grew until it became a tree, which was the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. The branches of those tree were imams. And the fruit of that tree is Imam Sahib al-Asr wa-Zaman, salawatullahi wa sallam. Imam Sahib al-Zaman is the fruits on those tree. And that is the last stage of the mercy of the Holy Prophet of Islam. You see, because there's a very famous hadith of the Holy Prophet where he comes and he says, "Awaluna Muhammad, awsatuna Muhammad, akhiruna Muhammad, wa kulluna Muhammad. He comes and he says, our first is Muhammad, our middle is Muhammad, our last is Muhammad, all of us are Muhammad. Imam Muhammad al-Mahdi will come and complete the last phase of the mercy of the Holy Prophet of Islam. You know today, one of the most feared concepts in the world is the very concept of the Messiah. Now, by the way, the concept of a Messiah is a universal Messiah that you find that exists in every single religion. Christians come and speak to you about the second coming of Jesus. The Jews come and speak to you about Mashiach, the coming of their Messiah, the son of David. Zoroastrians come and speak to you about Saushiant. You find even Buddhists come and speak to you about the coming of their Messiah. It's a universal concept that exists in every single religion. Yet one of the most feared concepts, you find nobody comes and says, I'm scared of the Messiah of Judaism. Nobody comes and says, I'm scared of the Messiah of Hinduism. Nobody comes and says, I'm scared of the Messiah of Christianity. Yet the world trembles to their bones the minute they hear the name Mahdi. Why? You know, there was a seminar in Israel about the Shia. One of the Jewish men stands up and he says, there are three things that the Shia have. You know, just by saying this, it gives me a boost of confidence. He says, there are three things that the Shia have that we fear, coming from the mouth of the horse. Number one, they have Hussein. Why do they fear Hussein? Because Hussein died, yet he still was victorious. Now I can kill the Shia, I can slaughter them, I can destroy them, and still they won't feel defeated. We're scared of that. Number one, they have Hussein. Number two, they have Marja'iyah. They have pillars. 
leaders, jurisprudence within their society. One of the biggest problems that we find in our communities is the fact that we tend to not necessarily disrespect, but diminish from the word of the maraja in our world. Our marja comes and says this, you find a number of people coming forward and not questioning him. There's no problem with questioning your marja. The Prophet himself was questioned. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنَ الْرُوحِ يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنَ الْأَنْفَالِ But the problem is where? The problem is when we begin to ridicule specific maraja. Marja A is a son of adultery. Marja B comes from the lineage of Yazid. And you'll find specific people coming forward and saying this. What's interesting is that they're in a basement in some distant country from the marja. Tell them, go out in public, go and speak. Go, and, go on the battlefield, you know? Why are you busy in your basement? He says, no, 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 I'm busy over here. Who's funding such people? Only Allah knows. We disrespect the maraja. Question them as much as you want. And by the way, when it comes to aqidah, when it comes to the very creed of Islam, being for example, theology, tawheed, nubuwa, imamah, you can't follow a marja when it comes to these specific things. You have to come to that own realization. We only follow the marja when it comes to fiqh. One of the biggest problems is that we tend to disrespect the marja. The Israeli man comes in and says they have marja'iyya. Number three, this Israeli man comes in and says they have Mahdi. Why are they scared of Mahdi, brothers and sisters? Have we asked that question? Because they know the last laugh is going to be ours. What a relaxing feeling. You know, imagine I'm fighting somebody and I know for sure I'm going to win. You know, it's like, for example, you're watching a uh, basketball match and you've watched it before and you know you're going to win. Your friend comes and tells you, haha, you're losing. You tell him, no, 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 I know I'm going to win. The last point is going to be mine. The last match, I don't know how the Knicks are doing. Are they doing pretty good, the Knicks? They're doing good, inshallah. You see, when you, when you see the Knicks are doing good, you say, okay, they're doing good. So alhamdulillah, I feel relaxed. Us, the Shia, we know that the last laugh is ours. You can destroy me in Iraq. You can rip the hijabs off our heads in France. You can kill our children in Iraq. You can go to Parachin or Pakistan and behead him simply because his name is Haider. Yeah, I know the last laugh is mine. When Allah comes and says, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ Chapter 28, verse number 5, Allah comes and says, We want to inherit for you the world. The last laugh will be yours. Allah comes and says, be confident, be relaxed. Yet you can't simply take it theoretically. You have to be practical with it. I know there is an imam waiting for me. Shouldn't I take it into consideration? That jealousy that I have hindering inside of me, stopping my progression towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shouldn't I take the initiative to go and conquer that jealousy? Arrogance, for example. One of the biggest problems is arrogance. Allah comes and says, kill that arrogance because there is that imam waiting for you. Understand it. Allah comes and says, take the Messiah and look at your life through the lens of this Messiah. You know, there was actually one of the congressmen, he was once sitting on Meet the Press, one of the most famous shows on ABC. And he came and he said, somebody comes and asks him a question. He tells him scenarios. If you attack this specific country and you find that they have the same weaponry as you, would you attack them? He said, yes. He said, but wouldn't that be a bad scenario? He said, yes, but we'll still attack them. He said, what if you attack them, you miss, and they attack you back? He said, that would be a bigger tragedy. He said, what if you attack them, you miss, they attack you back, and something escalates from there? He said, that would be a very bad tragedy. He said, if scenario after scenario is bad, one is worse than the other, why are you going to attack such a country? He said, for one reason. Because worse than all of these three scenarios, is if a man rises from Mecca with the flags of La ilaha illallah in his hand, striving to overthrow the agendas of us and the agendas of our country. You think they don't know Imam Mahdi? Wallah, today if we go into the White House, I promise you they probably have pictures of this man here and there, wanted, wanted. Some people go even to such an extent to say that they attacked the shrine of the 11th Imam, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, so that they can go into the shrine of our Imam to take some of his DNA and to examine it so that they can find the 12th Imam. They're doing everything, brothers and sisters. The question is, are we doing something? This is the question. 
coming to the majlis, sitting for and remembering Imam Hussein alayhi salam, remembering the Holy Prophet of Islam 1400 years after his death, this is keeping the message going. Matem, hitting the chest, is keeping the message going. That's connecting when we speak about connecting. Hitting the chest is a connection. There it is. You're connecting to the message. I cry for Imam Hussein. There it is. The switch is coming on. I'm connecting to the message. I come in, I say salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. What am I doing? I'm connecting to the message. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I'm sitting in my school, let me connect to the message. I see, for example, people coming and questioning me about Islam. I shouldn't back away. You know, just a few years ago, somebody comes and asks you about Islam, you would go, you would back away, you would withdraw, you would go into sajda, you would get scared. Today, Islam has reached such a level that not only are we scared to answer, but we're going to them and giving them Islam. Habibi, do you want to learn about Islam? Here it is. Do you know Muhammad? Let me explain Muhammad to you. Do you know who Ahl al-Bayt are? Let me explain it to you. This who Hussein, who is Hussein.org, for example. That's an excellent initiative to find the world, to give the world who is Hussein. I remember actually one day, and I typically mention this story on a common basis because I find it gets the message across. I was once in Miami, we we're passing out sandwiches, and a man came to me and he asked me, he said, why are you doing this? We're passing out to the homeless people. It was in the time of Muharram. I told him no specific reason for the sake of humanity. He said, but can I ask you a question? I said, yes, go ahead. He said, can you give me the real reason why you're passing out these sandwiches? I said, yes. I told him, have you heard of a name, Hussein? He said, who, Saddam Hussein? I told him, no, no, Habibi, Hussein, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's like, no, no, I've never heard of it. He said, who is this Hussein? I could have told him that Hussein was a man who was laying on the 10th of Muharram and Shimr was sitting on his chest. I didn't give him any of that emotional appeal. I told him one thing, one thing only, and Allah is my witness. He left with tears in his eyes. He said, who is this Hussein? I replied to him, I told him, Hussein is a man who died to keep the teachings of Jesus alive. He looked at me, he said, your Hussein has something to do with my Jesus? I told him, yes, he has everything to do with your Jesus. He's like, what does he have to do with him? I told him, Jesus, what did he die to propagate? He said, truth, liberty, freedom, equality. I said, Hussein died to keep all of these teachings alive. Hussein didn't only come for me, he came for you as well. Give it to the non-Muslim. When Allah comes and says, Id'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Invite to the path of your Lord with wisdom and kind wording. بِالَّتِهِ ahsan And with wisdom. What is wisdom? Is to know how to connect it. Brothers and sisters, in conclusion, the world today is hungry for Islam. The world today is dying for the truth. Let us give it to them. Somebody comes and asks a question, how do I give it to the non-Muslim? Through my words? No, through my character. Me simply walking and acting like a Muslim will attract people to my message. The Holy Prophet of Islam, the man who we all came to commemorate today, wouldn't go around speaking about Islam. He would act. You know, today you have these Jehovah's Witnesses who go and knock on doors. He wouldn't knock on doors, the Holy Prophet. He himself was the door. They would come knocking on him. There's a big difference. He would act with akhlaq. He would act with kind manners to the extent that they say the Prophet of Islam had such wisdom which was out of this world. They say his teeth looked like pearls. When sweat would come down from his forehead, Salman would run to take barakah from that sweat. They say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa one day he would be walking and Salman al-Muhammadi and Ali ibn Abi Talib was there with him. Look at the love that Salman had for the Holy Prophet of Islam. Do we have that love, brothers and sisters? Three people were walking. They say one of the companions turns around and he sees only a set of two footsteps. He stopped Rasulullah. He says, Ya Rasulullah, we're three people walking. Why do I see simply two footsteps, two set of footsteps? He said, O oh companion, that's Salman. Salman follows my footsteps step by step because of his love towards me. Yeah. Look at the love of Salman. That Salman attached himself to the Prophet. Why? Because the Prophet had this wisdom. I'll give you a simple story of the wisdom of the Prophet and we'll conclude and go to the Musibah. They say that one day the Holy Prophet of Islam was there in Mecca and the tribes of Quraysh had some dispute amongst them. They wanted to replace the foundations of the Kaaba, yet they were fighting as to who should do it. They said, listen, each corner will give it to a specific tribe. So the tribe of Walid goes and takes the left side of the Kaaba, they demolish it. 
The other tribe goes and takes the right side. The other tribe comes and takes the other side. They demolished the Kaaba completely until it was time to place the Hajr al-Aswad within the very Kaaba itself. When it came time for the Black Rock and Hajr al-Aswad, all of the tribes began to fight. They said, I want to do it. Another tribe came and said, no, 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 I want to do it. They said, listen, we're going to do something very simple. The next person who walks into the vicinity of the Kaaba will give him the ability to choose who's going to put the Black Rock within the Kaaba. They wait and they see the Holy Prophet coming in. Instantly they look at the Prophet and they say, that is As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. That is the honest, the trustworthy. Notice how they didn't say that is Muhammad. No, 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 because he wasn't known for his name. He said, my name isn't important. Today every time Dick and Harry is busy in spreading their name. Allah comes and says, the name isn't important. It's the message that you carry behind that name. They say, that is Sadiq Al-Ameen. Let him come and do it. The Holy Prophet comes in to the tribes. Look at the wisdom of the Prophet. They say that the Prophet would take a blanket. He would say, I want each tribe to take a specific corner of the blanket. One tribe comes and takes the right side. One tribe comes and takes the left side. The other two tribes come and take the following corners of the blanket. The Prophet comes and says, take this rock and place it inside of the blanket. They place it inside of the blanket. He says, now all four of you walk towards the area where you want to place this Hajr al-Aswad. They walk. Instantly, the Prophet comes and says, I'm going to take this black rock and I'm going to place it inside of the Kaaba. With the wisdom of the Prophet, a battle that sprung from this dispute for four days to the extent that one of the tribes came and took a jar and they soaked it, they filled it with blood. They dipped their hand within these jars and they said, we're ready to fight. That was a sign within the times of Arabia that I'm ready to kill somebody. You would take your hands, you would dip it in a jar filled with blood saying that I'm ready to fight. They were ready to kill people. They were up to their teeth in fighting the people. The Prophet came and instantly extinguished the fire of dispute from the people by that simple method. Look at the hikmah of the Holy Prophet. This is the rahmah of the Holy Prophet. That when you examine all of the Prophets, they had specific names and specific titles. Musa was known as Kalimullah. Ibrahim was known as Khalilullah. Nuh was known as, for example, Nabiullah. Yet Muhammad was known as Habibullah, the beloved of Allah. Allah loved him so much because he was a man of mercy. He was a man who always fought for the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say until the very last moment of the Prophet's life, he would connect to wilaya. You know when we speak about wilaya, the Prophet until his very last breath, he's there laying on his deathbed. He says, bring to me my cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at how he's always connected to wilaya. Even the Prophet himself, he's connected to the very wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, bring to me my cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib. They would bring Amir al-Mu'mineen. He would tell him, oh Ali, I want you to place your head on my lap. They say Amir al-Mu'mineen would do the following. The Prophet would begin to speak to him, telling him, oh Ali, I'm placing this trust in your hand. And he would point to Fatima to Zahra, salamullah alayha. I ask you brothers and sisters, Amir al-Mu'mineen, his trust was Fatima. Yet what happened to the ribs of Fatima after the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib? After the death of the Holy Prophet of Islam? You know why it was so sad to see the Holy Prophet of Islam leave this world? Because he began to look at each and every single one of his family members and he would begin to foretell them of what was to come to them and take them away. He would look at Hassan alayhi salam, he would tell him, Oh Hassan, it's almost as if I see that liver being spit out of your blessed mouth. He would look at Fatima. He would say, oh Fatima, it's almost as if I see that wicked hand slapping your blessed cheeks. He would look at Hussein, and he would say, oh Hussein, it's almost as if I see the hooves of the horses crushing into your blessed chest. And then he would look at Ali ibn Abi Talib and he would give him a look that only Rasulullah knows how to give to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He would tell him, oh Ali, it's almost as if I see that sword plunging into your skull and soaking the blood of your head with your blessed beard. Yet then he would turn to Fatima once again and he would say, oh Fatima, those ribs of yours, what will happen to them after I leave this world? You know what was the saddest thing, brothers and sisters? 
when Zainab alayhi salam would come to the Holy Prophet of Islam. You know, Zainab, how much did she see? She saw Amir al muminin being struck. Zainab saw Fatima to Zahra squished between the wall and the door. And Zainab also had to see the Holy Prophet of Islam leaving this world. They say that when Zainab alayhi salam was there next to the body of Rasulullah, all of them are surrounding the Blessed Prophet's body. The Prophet all of a sudden he hears a knock on the door. He says, oh Fatima, go and open that door. They say Fatima to Zahra would go and open the door. She would see that nobody was there waiting next to the door. She would close the door, she would come back to Rasulullah. She would tell him, Ya Rasulullah, I opened the door and nobody was there. Why is it that the door was knocked? He would turn to her, he would say, Ya Fatima, that was the angel of death. He's embarrassed to take me instantly. He took the initiative to knock on the door because I am Rasulullah. They say, while they are surrounding the body of Rasulullah, Rasulullah closes his eyes. The Holy Prophet extends his legs. He begins to repeat these lines, farewelling his family members, saying, Bismillah wa billah wa ala millati rasulillah. They say that the prophet, all of the sudden a gasp of air comes out of his blessed mouth. They say that Fatima would come to his body, saying, Abba ya Rasulullah, wake up and speak to me. The prophet didn't open his eyes, he didn't say a word. Rasulullah was gone. I ask you, brothers and sisters, what happened to Fatima to Zahra once the Holy Prophet left this world? They say that the Prophet, السلام, when he was there in his grave, Fatima to Zahra would go and begin to visit him, saying these famous lines of poetry, saying, Mada ala man shamma turbat ahmad Allah ya shumma mada zaman أبا صبت علي مصائب لو أنها صبت على الأيام صرنا ليالي They say when Fatima to Zahra would go and visit the very grave of her father Rasulullah She would say, oh Prophet, wake up and see what your companions have done to me The same ones that profess their love and obedience to you Are now squishing me between the door and the wall when Fatima alayhi salam fell on to the ground. Take your minds to Medina, brothers and sisters. There she is, the daughter of Rasulullah. She falls on to the ground with her ribs crushed. She would say, Ya Fidda, come and aid me. Oh Fidda, come. Wallah, they have broken my ribs into pieces. Yet I ask you, brothers and sisters, for you and I, it's difficult to narrate the Musiba of Fatima. Yet what went through the mind of Amir al muminin The very hand that had to pass by the rib of Fatima to Zahra. They say that Amir al muminin was one day sitting in his house. Ammar ibn Yasir would go into his room. He would say, oh Amir al muminin why do we see you crying heavily? Why do we see you isolating yourself from the people? Anta alladhi tu'allimuna ala sabr. You are the one that teaches us about patience. Why why do we see you in this situation? He would tell him, Oh, Ammar, if you saw what I saw, you would cry as well. He told him, Oh, Ammar, yes, I am the line of Allah. He told him, What do you mean you are the line of Allah? What does that have to do with anything? He told him, Oh, Ammar, it's almost as if Amir al Mu'minin was telling him, Oh, Ammar, I had to break the door of Khaybar, but never did I have to pass my hand on the ribs of my wife Fatima. They say that Amir al Mu'minin tells him, Oh, Ammar, yeah. 
when I placed the body of Fatima on the maghsal. He told him, yes, what did you see? He said, my hand passed by the ribs of Fatima. He told him, oh, Ammar, by Allah, never did Fatima tell me what happened to her ribs. I had to find out. Yet I ask you, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you couldn't handle seeing one rib or two ribs of Fatima broken. What would you have done if you went to Karbala? As Hussein was being crushed by the hooves of the horses. Abu Abdullah laid not one day, not two days, but three whole days without any ghusl, without any kafan, without anyone shrouding that blessed body, body. Yet, brothers and sisters, I ask you, what went on through the mind of Zainab? It all goes back to Zainab, alayhi salam. They say that when Zainab, alayhi salam, was passing by the bodies on the 10th of Muharram. Imagine this, there she is, Zainab, passing by the body of Abbas, passing by the body of Akbar, passing by the body of Hussein, she wanted to go and farewell Aba Abdullah al Hussein one last time. Uh, all of a sudden, while she's running to the body of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, she hears a faint voice behind her. She turns around. Uh, she hears that someone is telling her, Amma Zainab, my own Zainab, have mercy upon my weak body. She says, Who are you? Identify yourself. Uh, he would say Anna Zainul Abidi he would tell her, oh, on Zainab, farewell, Hussein, from upon the camel. They say that Zainab would go upon the camel. She would say, As-salamu alayk, ya Aba Abdullah. As-salamu alayk, ya Ibn Rasulillah. One narration which breaks the heart comes forth and says that Zainab, alayhi salam, saw an old man crying on the body of Aba Abdullah. Abdullah al Hussein, a man with disheveled hair, a man with no slippers on his feet, a man with ripped clothing. She would tell him, Oh man, please don't harm my brother Hussein. Wallah, he is already dead. You can't harm him any further. They say that the man would turn around and say, Zainab, why didn't you recognize me? I am Muhammad. I am Rasulullah. You see, brothers, we are crying about Muhammad, yet Muhammad would cry about Hussein. He would be there looking at the body of Abba Abdullah saying Salla alayka maliku samaya qataluka wa ma arafu man jadduka wa man abuk Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa taala. For indeed, on a night like this, being the night of the death of the greatest man to ever exist, Allah subhanahu wa taala will never leave our du'as unanswered. Let us raise our hands and ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to hasten the appearance of our twelfth and awaited Imam. With the ayat al mubaraka five times with the loudest of your voices. Many people have sick ones. One of the brothers requested me to mention her in our du'as. Many of us have problems in our lives which we want to be resolved. Many of us have issues which nobody knows except Allah. Today, spill those problems out from your heart and speak to Rasulullah because he's the greatest wasila we can take to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد 
اللهم شافي كل مريض. Raise your hands, brothers and sisters, to the sky. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know that you're a serious servant of His. اللهم شافي كل مريض. بحق مريض كربلاء زين العابدين. اللهم اقضي حوائج المحتاجين. اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم اخذ للكفر والمنافقين اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصار وعواني والمستشهدين بين يدي أما يجيب five times with the loudest of your voices بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما All together, أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء، أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء، أما One more time. أما يجيب المطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا كاشف السوء اكشف السوء عنا يا الله. Oh Allah, we ask you بحق محمد المصطفى وبالمرتضى علي وبالزهراء فاطمة وبالمجتبى حسان وبالشهيد حسين إلا قضيت لنا حوائجنا جميعا يا Allah and to answer our prayers and to bless the organizers of this majlis and so that we are blessed with the ziyar and shafa of the Holy Prophet of Islam and his family. We recite in Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha but before the loudness of your salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.